Welcome to Dispatches, a shorter podcast from the old front line and me, military historian Paul Reed. More than four decades ago, a British military historian fascinated by the Great War went up in a plane over the battlefields of the Western Front to record what he saw of that landscape. What does aerial survey, what did that journey four decades ago, what does it tell us about the old front line? This week, the death of Martin Middlebrook, one of the most important Great War historians of recent times, was sadly announced. For many of us interested in the subjects of the First World War, Martin has been a familiar companion as we've examined the fighting on the Somme or in the March Offensive, the Kaiserschlacht of 1918, and those two periods covered in his two seminal books on the subject really have helped define people's understanding, I think, of the Great War. And his books were not only superbly written, full of detail, they lifted the voices of ordinary soldiers from the dark shadows into the sunlight, and in a way that few others up to that point had done. He was a true champion, really, of oral history and history from below, because his books are not full of details and accounts and stories of senior officers. It's just ordinary men in those extraordinary circumstances of the Great War. In many ways, Martin Middlebrook invented a new way of looking at the war, that way of looking at it through those ordinary soldiers, taken on by others like Lynn MacDonald, who did such important work in that same time period of the 1970s and 80s. And it's an approach and a view of the war that has clearly appealed to a wide audience. When we read those books, we see the stories of ordinary Tommies, And we relate that to those in our own family story and how they might have experienced those great battles along the trenches of the Western Front. And I think those books by Martin Middlebrook and Lynn MacDonald and many others really helped generate interest in the First World War in a time when there was so little interest, when the veterans were fading away the battlefields of the old front line were quiet and the general public really was not interested in that conflict. It was very different many years later during the centenary when there was this huge public engagement with the First World War and although that has declined, we're now a decade from the beginning of the centenary, I kind of feel there's a bit of an upsurge in interest, one that I'm seeing on social media interest in podcasts and films on YouTube as well. And for me, Martin Middlebrook's books were, of course, really, really important in my understanding of the First World War. And I first came across them on my very first trip to the Somme in 1982, when the hotel I was staying in, the Hotel de la Basilique, opposite the Basilica in Albert, a place where Martin used to stay, had some of his books for sale behind the hotel reception. This was something that he did quite frequently because there was no visitor centres in those days, no bookshops to go to, and what Martin would do was bring some of his books over and leave them in some key places where they could be bought by people like me. So I picked up a copy of The First Day of the Somme, and I read that book from cover to cover, really kind of digested those stories whole almost and it was a book that truly fascinated me and I think took me down a path which I continue on to this day and I was lucky over the years since to meet Martin and get to know Martin on many occasions but Martin's death has made me realise that those members of the old guard as I call them like him who were very much at the forefront of the study of the Great War 
in that period when I first travelled to those battlefields in the early 1980s, they've almost faded away. In the same way, the veterans of that conflict that I knew have faded away too. And that leaves me sad, really. I kind of think of Martin Middlebrook and Lynn MacDonald and John Terrain and Tony Spagnoli, and there are many others. They've all gone, and many of those names are barely recognised by people today, but they did so much, like I say, to bring the Great War back in to a public focus. And one whose name I haven't mentioned that would be in that list, who is much less known, and, and that grieves me that he is less known, and that was John Giles. John Giles was a veteran of the Second World War. He'd been in the armed forces himself, and later he stood for Parliament, had a business career, and he was interested in the Great War because his father had served with the 1st Battalion Royal West Kent. He was a regular soldier, and he'd lost his leg at the Battle of Mons in August 1914, that first British action of the war. And as a consequence of that, John had always been fascinated by the subject. He began his battlefield visits just after the Second World War, and they grew and they grew in intensity throughout the 50s and 60s and on into the 70s, which led him to write two books that were privately published, Eep Then and Now and The Somme Then and Now. And he wanted to kind of convey his journey along that old front line through veteran testimony, through original artefacts and documents, and then and now photographs to chronicle those two great British and Commonwealth battlefields of the First World War. And he was greatly inspired by veterans. He lived in Kent, he lived in an old windmill at the village of Ash, just outside of Canterbury in East Kent. And he knew in that Kent area a large number of Great War veterans and was connected to other Great War enthusiasts like himself, which did include, of course, Martin Middlebrook and also Tony Spagnoli, John Dre, who I often talk about on this podcast, was also a great friend of, of John Giles. And because there were so few visitors to the battlefields in those days, it was like a little gang. People knew each other and they were really, really cooperative and friendly and helped each other. And that was something that really they kind of passed on to me, really, because when I was a young man, I got to meet all of them. And they all went out of their way to help me as they were helping others. And that was a lesson that I think has kind of stuck with me ever since. But inspired by those veterans, in the late 1970s, John got a group of these people together in Ypres. And as he said on many occasions, he banged his fist down on the table and said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to form an organisation so that the Great War is not forgotten. And that organisation was the Western Front Association, which came into being in 1980. And John was the founder and the first chairman of the WFA. And it was very much veteran-focused. It was about the veterans. In some ways, it was kind of for the veterans. There they were in the twilight of their years, and they were brought out of obscurity and made to feel as if their voice and what they stood for and all the things that they'd done were important again, which, of course, now we know that that was the case and that was true and, and it needed to be celebrated in that way. Sadly, for so many, that was far too late. But the WFA filled a bit of a gap then and it grew. And, of course, I was not an original member of the WFA, but I travelled to the Somme in that summer of 1982 with my dad and bought Martin Middlebrook's book in the Hotel Basilique and up in the window of that hotel was a poster for the Western Front Association with the address of John Giles. And I wrote to him when I got back and I explained that I was just a teenager. I was 15 years old and I was fascinated by the Great War. I'd kind of grown up on the stories of it from my grandmother. And I was so delighted after my first visit to the Somme to read about this organisation and very much wanted to be a member. Now, he could have just said it costs this amount to join, fill in this form and welcome aboard, but he wrote me a very 
long letter saying how pleased he was that a member of the younger generation had gone in touch and was inspired to study the Great War and remember the Great War and join the Western Front Association. And he invited me to their next meeting up in London, which I went to, and he said, come and say hello. So I did, expecting him not even to remember who I was, but he made a big fuss of me and he introduced me to several veterans, one of whom was Charles Carrington, who had written books on the Great War, another kind of seminal author of the First World War. And at that meeting that I went to, I didn't know it that first time, but as I went a few times subsequently, there were other Great War authors there, like Norman Gladden, who wrote Somme 1916 and Ypres 1917 and Across the Piave, and Herbert Salzbach, a Jewish German officer who had served in the artillery in the Great War and wrote the book with German guns, and he was there as well, and I got to meet all of them. I mean, that was a time in which the Great War was largely forgotten, but I look back upon it and, and realise how fortunate I was and how privileged I was to meet people like John Giles and the veterans who were there, and then through all of that, other people besides, including Martin Burrowbrook and John Terrain and others. And I think for many of us who were members then, the late Dave O'Mara, who did so much to bring the story of the French army out of the shadows, he was about the same kind of age as me, and we were both young members of the WFA, and we met a few times on the battlefields then. I think we were so lucky to be there at that time, and I think many other members besides. And I think it it was an organisation and people within it that laid the, the pathway, really, for us listening to this podcast, making this podcast, thinking about the subject of the Great War and all of the other podcasts that are out there and books and everything else. They kind of laid the pathway of all that to be able to happen. So it was an important chapter, I think, in in not just the kind of study of the Great War and the historiography of the Great War, but the way that we remember the Great War. Now, one thing I didn't know then in 1982 is that when I first met him, John had just come back from completing a really important project that the Western Front Association had done in its early years. And this project was to catalogue the battlefields of the Western Front, particularly those British and Commonwealth battlefields, from above to take aerial photographs of this. And that was something that was quite extraordinary in 1982, even then, the hire of a private aircraft to fly across those battlefields was not cheap, which is why the Western Front Association had to use some of its funds to, to pay for this. An aerial kind of survey of battlefields was pretty much unheard of. The last time it had happened, really, was during the Great War, when both sides had used aerial photography to photograph those front lines while the fighting was on for intelligence purposes. So this was a a really important project, which he, he went on to write about in Stand 2, which is the Journal of the Western Front Association. And if you are a WFA member, then you can go online to their website and all of the back copies of Stand 2 are available to download now. And if you're not a Western Front Association member, I really would encourage you to join. It's got so many resources on its website now that it's worth the membership fee for those alone, let alone the magazines that you receive and access to kind of local meetings and national meetings and other stuff besides. So he wrote about it in Stand 2, number 7, but that was then put into a little booklet, a kind of landscape size booklet, that was then sent to you when you ordered some of these pictures because it wasn't just about photographing the battlefields, and he did this in black and white with prints and then in colour with slides it wasn't just about photographing it and keeping it in the kind of wfa archive it was much more than that these prints and these slides were then available for members to purchase and when you bought some this little booklet came with it explaining what pictures were available and then an account of his flights what he did to take these photographs and that's some of that is what i'm going to read for you now so what did John have to say about that flight over the battlefields of the Great War? He called the account Wings Over Flanders, which is the same title that we've used for this podcast. And he begins his accounts with this. 
On a hot, sunny, but very hazy day in July 1982, a tiny high-winged monoplane circled over the city of Ypres, engine purring smoothly and white-painted wings glinting against the blue sky. Round and round it went at a height of about 1,500 feet, and people could be seen looking up at it from the famous Grand Place, no doubt wondering about its occupants and the reason for its buzzing about over the spire of St. Martin's Cathedral and the huge bulk of the cloth hall. Inside the aircraft were two people, these being the pilot, Tony Shepard, and myself, John Giles, and we were there to enable me to take black and white photographs and colour slides on behalf of the WFA Aerial Photographic Project, launched several months earlier. Now, Tony Shepard, the pilot, was not just a random pilot who'd provided the plane for John. He was a Western Front Association member, fascinated by the Great War, commercial, former commercial pilot, and someone that I got to know through John and through Tony Spagnolia, fantastic guy. And so there they were, flying over Ypres. They'd flown over from Kent, flying over Ypres, and John was now not on the battlefields of the Great War, not walking them as he did, not going round them in his car or on a coach. He was now above them. And what was it that he began to see? He says, We then set course for the infamous Hellfire Corner, which during most of the war years of 1914-18 was registered down to the inch by German artillery, and no British or Allied troops ever loitered. After more photographs there, we continued above the straight road to Bellawada Ridge and Hoog, scene of some of the most violent actions of the war, including the first Flammenwerfer attack and the site of intense mining activity, the whole length of that awful ridge being cratered by mine explosions and the opposing trenches being within a few yards of each other. Even now, a few of those original craters can still be seen, water-filled and rounded, looking from the air like peaceful cattle ponds, but in actual fact, evidence of the hell that formerly raged above and below this now grass and crop-covered land, where over six decades ago men grappled in mortal combat from the possession of those very craters, stabbing and shooting in their anger at those of the opposite side who were trying to do exactly the same thing. Close to several of the craters could be seen the British Cross of Sacrifice, erected to commemorate the resting place of an officer and 11 other ranks killed by an explosion which rent the ground asunder as they toiled in their duty of making things as uncomfortable as possible for the men in the enemy trenches. Their remains lie there to this day, entombed forever in what is known as the Royal Engineer's Grave Railway Wood, surmounted by the white stone cross, from the base of which the spires and the buildings of Ypres can clearly be seen. This memorial is a reminder to others that this is indeed sacred ground. Swooping in those skies above the Western Front, like the aircraft of old, John and Tony, in the next phase of their journey, it took them across the scars of the war, what we would now call the archaeology of the Great War. But we have to remember that that concept of this landscape with its scars being part of an archaeology of an entire subject like the Great War was something that was pretty much unheard of in 1982. No archaeologists were working on what we'd now call conflict archaeology. Certainly within Flanders, it just wasn't even considered as part of that discipline. But yet then, 40-odd years ago, there were far more scars, visible scars on the landscape than there are today, which is why this project really was so important something that we'll return to in the podcast and as they approached those scars John wrote this from Bellawada Ridge we turned south passing over the hamlet of Hoog including Hoog Chateau rebuilt near the site of the original building which was totally destroyed and where a huge mine was blown in 1915 just before the Flammenwerfer attack which incinerated a number of British soldiers then over to Sanctuary Wood and Hill 62, location of the Canadian Memorial, and part of the wood itself could just be seen amongst the leafy trees, the few remaining trenches in Flanders, most of the original widespread gashes in the earth having long since disappeared, 
through the passage of time by ploughing and recultivation of the battlefields. Then over to nearby Hill 60, a most infamous place left as it was after the war as a perpetual memorial still covered in shell holes and crowned by a British pillbox built over a German strongpoint. Hill 60 has an evil reputation and beneath that grassy mound lie the remains of many men of both sides killed during the bitter underground fighting that once was commonplace in that now peaceful area. The vast mine blown at the commencement of the Battle of Messines in 1917 is hardly noticeable now, unlike others. It made up one of the 19 exploded at 3.10am on that fateful morning of 7th of June 1917. When they all went up it was like a massive earthquake and the top of the Messines ridge was literally blown out of existence. To the absolute joy of the attacking British soldiers and the horror and dismay of the defending Germans, most of whom were so shocked that the ridge was quickly overrun and all objectives reached with very few casualties. Messines was one of the very few successes of the war, and today the mine craters, mostly on private land, can still be seen as mute witnesses to the infernos which erupted beneath the German lines on a still summer morning so many years ago. After the scars of war which they could see from their cockpit, John and the pilot crossed the open fields beyond to what was one of the most iconic Great War battlefields in Flanders. John wrote, After passing over Tynecott British Military Cemetery, the largest in Flanders where the remains of almost 12,000 men lie buried, we circled that infamous village, the village of Passchendaele, once totally obliterated but later solidly rebuilt and now quiet and pleasant, with just a few hundred yards away at Crest Farm, the small but attractive Canadian memorial which commemorates the capture of the village ruins by those superb fighters on November the 6th, 1917. In all directions, summer expressed itself in green and gold, where nature, guided by man, had taken over from the total desolation of former years, as it has at so many other places along the length of the old western front. Passchendaele is indeed now at peace, and may it ever remain so, even if its sinister reputation lives on in history. Then, with fuel supplies getting low, and with a final look in the direction of Zonnebeek and other places I know so well, we set course for the south and Arras, where we were due to stay for the night before going on to Combray and then the Somme area for further photographic efforts. Eep, the city I have visited each year for more than 20 years, and which I have looked upon as my second home, faded into the distance. A chance ray of sunshine filtering through the haze and silhouetting the Cloth Hall Belfry Tower, where in 1960 I gazed in wonderment for the first time to be followed by so many more visits at the scars of World War I etched into the stonework. To our soldiers of the 1914-18 war, Ypres was known as wipers, and those who passed through its grim rat-infested ruins will never forget the experience. John later said at several WFA meetings and privately that doing that flight changed his whole perspective of the battlefields of the Great War. He was often one that said that the war at ground level and that war underground that he hints at in his account was vitally important of course but he always said look up the war in the air is just as important. And then with this flight, with this project, he had the chance to do exactly the opposite and look down at his beloved battlefields from above. As he said, Our airmen who flew over the wasteland that was once a city must have also wondered at man's capacity to destroy and how amazed those same flyers would have been if they'd been able to share my experience and to see that the reborn city was basking in warm, peaceful sunlight. This trip, all those years ago, was a snapshot of the battlefields 
quite literally because he was taking photographs. And these photographs were made available, as we've said, to WFA members. They were published in Stand 2 and the Bulletin, the other magazine, and in some of John's later books. And I'm lucky to have his personal album of the flight. And I'll put a picture on the podcast website of some of the pictures from it and also the kind of frontispiece of the of the album in which he highlights what they were they were doing in that flight. He kept that as a special memento and something that he looked at again and again and again and he never forgot that flight. He never repeated it. He never went up in an aircraft over the battlefields again. It was a unique experience for him and one, like I say, I think that changed his perspective of those old battlefields and gave him a sense something that I've learned over time of the importance of landscape and the Great War, the landscape of the war itself and how the geology and the landscape affected the fighting, but the landscape as it is today where those crisscross pathways take us across the echoes and the shadows of more than a century ago. And when I look back over those 40-odd years since he made that flight and what he did then, I'm mindful of how I've surveyed the battlefields myself from above, both in a plane and much later by drone. What does this aerial survey really tell us, both his and, and the continuation of this, not just by me, but by many others? You've only got to go on to YouTube to find lots of drone footage of the battlefields as they are today. Well, his snapshots, the photographs that he took in 1982, were photographs of even then a changing landscape. Anyone who's travelled to Ypres in particular over the years will know how development has spread across those battlefields. And I think that when I stood in certain cemeteries on the outskirts of Ypres on that very first visit in 1982 and had uninterrupted views back into the city, that is all gone, that has all changed now. And areas where there were other scars of war, they have gone as well and and capturing as he did that landscape before those changes and then capturing many of those scars of war that do not exist today up on the Belawar the ridge that he flew over many of the mine craters were filled in within just a few years of him taking that flight so already they were lost and those field ghosts if you like of France and Flanders which can only be seen from the air or from a distance, the scars, particularly in landscapes like Arras and the Somme, where it's chalk, where you can see the ghost-like scars of the trench systems, you can see some of those at ground level. If you stand near the Ulster Tower at certain times of the year and look across the valley, you can see the scars of the German trenches, of the front line positions around Hemel and towards Bokor. But really, you need to be above that battlefield. And now with a drone it's very easy to kind of capture that. And again, I've seen crop marks in fields on aerial photographs taken by drones where you can see the zigzag shape of the trenches. So I think having this aerial perspective is really important in our understanding of the landscape. And because the landscape continues to change, we've, as we've mentioned on this podcast, we've got the upcoming Canal du Nord canal extension which is going to change that part of the Western Front forever. It's really important that these images taken from above and ground level, they are part of our catalogue, of our knowledge, collective knowledge of the Great War, and it's important that they survive. And it's good that many of John Giles' images survive. I don't believe the WFA have the master images anymore. What happened to them, I don't really know. But they do appear in a lot of John's books, and like I say, I'll put some onto the podcast website and that little flight in 1982 it just wasn't one man's vanity to do that let's get up in a plane take some photographs it wasn't just a pet project it was something much more important than that as i've said you know those people like john giles were true trailblazers when it comes to the great war we owe them so much john giles and martin mirabrook who we started this podcast with they were true pioneers and with their passing and this week with Martin's passing I think we do see a chapter of the Great War closing. We owe them so much they shone a light on what was then very much in the darkness 
They lit the way in many respects for all of us to not only understand the Great War, but to be able to walk those criss-cross pathways of the battlefields, those criss-cross pathways that take us always, ever along the old front line. You've been listening to Dispatches, part of the Old Front Line podcast, with me, military historian Paul Reed. If you've enjoyed this episode, please think about leaving a review on your favourite podcast platform, giving us a rating, and leaving a comment on the podcast website, oldfrontline.co.uk. You can follow us on Twitter, and if you want to support the podcast, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash oldfrontline or buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash oldfrontline. Thanks for listening and see you again soon.